finding your seat on the bus, investigating incident command structure, and how it applies to smart staffing in the National Weather Service operational environment. My name is Kelly Allen. I'm the Warning Coordination Meteorologist at the National Weather Service Forecast Office in North Platte, Nebraska. And in the next 30 minutes, we'll briefly review what ICS is and how it may be relevant to NWS operations, and more specifically to the National Weather Service Evolve initiatives the range of positions within Incident Command and how they would apply to NWS operations. And finally, we'll go through intelligence staffing through the use of a Decision Support Services Planning Board. The Incident Command Structure, or ICS, is an emergency management system designed to allow its users to adjust its structure based on the complexity and unique needs of the incident. The people who are working in incident may be drawn from multiple agencies that don't routinely work together. An ICS is designed to give a standard response using common procedures and terminology in order to help prevent miscommunication. ICS is used by all levels of government as well as by many in the private sector. It is typically structured to facilitate activities in five major functional areas – command, operations, planning, logistics, and finance administration. All the functional areas may or may not be used based on the incident needs. As a system, ICS is extremely useful. Not only does it provide an organizational structure for incident management, but it also guides the process for planning, building, and adapting that structure. Using ICS for every incident or planned event helps hone and maintain skills needed for large-scale incidents. Our agency is working toward removing the roadblocks that keep us from offering that direct, scalable, meaningful support to our partners through the NWS Evolve initiatives. Now let's do our part and learn the language of our deep relationship partners and begin to anticipate what they might need to keep people safe from hazardous weather. All WFO personnel should be familiar with the Incident Command Structure, or ICS. The use of ICS in day-to-day -day operations is strongly encouraged regardless of incident type. Becoming comfortable with ICS will help us all seamlessly move from the office into an incident management team or into an emergency operations center. It will also benefit our operations as we use a tried and true system to expand and contract our preparation and response according to the weather. By implementing incident command structure in our daily and enhanced operations, we can readily provide more meaningful material to the public through various channels including the traditional products like the area forecast discussion or watch and warning products, but also through more user-friendly avenues like the weather story, situation reports, and through Facebook and Twitter. Using ICS can also allow us to enhance communication through our partners through the use of media interviews, NWS chat, email blasts, webinar briefings, and through the good old-fashioned telephone. As incidents escalate, there will be someone other than a forecaster worrying about communicating a unified message to our public and to our partners. That way, forecasters can focus on forecasts, radar operators can focus on short fuse warnings, the flood analysts can focus on flooding. You get the idea. Everyone has their place on the bus. One of the core functions of ICS is to provide a means with which we can keep our span of control in check. When referencing span of control, most consider the traditional definition of the number of subordinates a supervisor has, which according to studies is optimized at 5, but should be at 7 or less. However, span of control can also apply to tasks or, and or resources that you're expected to handle. There are many things to consider when deciding whether or not your span of control is appropriate, including capability. What's your capability? What's the capability of the team? Someone who doesn't normally do upper air as a part of his or her duties may not be able to multitask. What if the only people who are available are all inexperienced? Then you'll need more people to do the same amount of work an experienced crew could do. Number two, similarity of task. Your span of control can be wider if everything you're doing builds on each other. For instance, the mesoanalyst could also be the tornado genesis specialist because both duties are rooted in the same kind of task. Then there's volume of tasks. If one person has too many other responsibilities, then their span of control needs to be shrunk. Could the incident commander also take on warning coordinator duties? Probably on a normal day, but if the volume of tasks associated with the warning coordinator position increase, 
the duty needs to be assigned to someone else who could handle the volume or split off to a standalone position. People who work for the National Weather Service have a tremendous sense of duty. We're public servants who are here to protect lives and property. What's more noble and some may argue heroic than that? We need to make a culture shift from donning the cape and carrying the entire workload by ourselves. We've got to do more with less, you might say. You're not really serving the public when you're managing more than you can easily and effectively handle. So how do we handle the workload when we're tasked with more and more DSS and we never seem to drop any legacy products? This is why we have a team, a staff. You don't need to do it all at once. You don't need to be the best at every task. You just need to plan and delegate wisely. Like the queen is saying to the king down there in the corner, you have to delegate some authority. You don't delegate the road painting task to the town baker. Delegate it to the town maintenance supervisor. But for goodness sake, don't do it yourself. You're needed elsewhere. So what are the incident command structure positions? And are they relatable to NWS operations? Many of you are already familiar with incident command structure, but it wouldn't hurt to briefly review the key positions within ICS. It's important to note that each individual participating in the operation reports to only one supervisor. This ensures unity of command. In addition, ICS requires that any single person's span of control should be between about five and seven individuals. Anything more than, than that begins to overload the individual and the command structure should be expanded. This is fundamental to the ICS chain of command structure. It is organized in such a way as to expand and contract as needed by the incident scope, resources, and hazards. Command is established in a top-down fashion with the most essential and authoritative positions established first. Only positions required should be established. At the top of the hierarchy, you have the command staff, and at the top of the top is the incident commander. He or she is the one who oversees the entire incident. The public information officer, liaison officer, and safety officer report directly to the incident commander. The incident commander is the person responsible for the common operating picture. They set the tone and priorities. While the incident commander can be the decider and the doer on smaller events, this duty can and should be quickly isolated as an incident increases in scope and complexity. You don't want the incident commander on radar during a tornado outbreak. The public information officer coordinates incident response to the media and to the public, while the liaison officer coordinates response to other agencies. These duties in an NWS setting would be so similar as to not need splitting in the vast majority of cases. The safety officer monitors safety conditions and develops measures for assuring the safety of all involved. These positions report only to the incident commander. The general staff includes four section chiefs, operations, tasked with directing all actions to meet incident objectives, planning, tasked with the collection and display of incident information, consisting of the status of all resources and the overall status as the incident of the incident as a whole. So if someone from the weather service were to embed in an incident management team, we would usually go under the planning section since weather is an integral part of the incident status. Finance or administration section tasks incident related costs, personnel records, and stuff like that. Logistics provides all resources, services, and support that the incident may require, like catering, for example. Underneath each section chief is where the incident customization begins. Each of these individuals report to their branch director, who in turn reports to the section chief. Then the section chief reports to the incident commander. Each one of these resources has their own limited span of control that fits into the bigger picture, the objective that needs to be met. So let's take a look at a couple of real world examples and then try to apply this method to our own operations. The organization surrounding wildfire management is probably one of the best examples of how incident command structure is used in the real world. Wildfire management scales up and down fluidly as the event evolves. This is an example of a fairly complex wildfire where many of the general ICS roles are filled to meet the needs of a fire on a forest service land. Most of the top positions remain the same. There's an added layer here showing the involvement of the area forestry program manager 
who needs to know what's going on with this incident in the context of the forest area as a whole. This person only communicates with the IC. The general staff also remains the same with four levels, operations, planning, logistics, and finance. This customization really begins underneath the general staff. The operations section is responsible for the suppression and rescue elements of the incident action plan. The planning section is responsible for collecting, evaluating, and distributing data about the incident, and that includes weather. Like other sections, the planning section grows as the incident grows. The logistics section is responsible for pre providing services and support needs related to the incident. On large incidents, the logistics section can be divided into two branches, service and support. The finance administration unit is used on large incidents that require on-site financial management. This next example highlights a more short fuse example, the active shooter. The Idaho State Department of Education put together this ICS chart as an example. As you can see, the top positions remain the same, and the unique needs of the incident are addressed underneath each section chief. So how can we apply the same method to our operations? I'm sure most of you have seen this chart out in operations and in the Severe Weather Operations Manual. We've attempted to provide some guidance on staffing levels and when escalation might be required to properly provide the level of service needed to fulfill our mission in the age of DSS. It's always difficult to put hard numbers on a system that was meant to be fluid, but we're scientists and we like numbers. In addition, we're not on call like many emergency responders, so this makes planning for these events that much more important. So once we have enough people for an event, where do they go? Where can the pieces of the puzzle fit the best? So what are the tools we have in place to use for planning? Out in operations, you'll see a DSS planning board with the common tasks and positions either written on the board or on a movable magnet. Every person will have their duties laid out at the beginning of their shift. At a minimum, the board should be considered at the transition from one incident commander to another. If you have no duties assigned to you, or if you're not on the board at all, consult the incident commander or whomever is briefing you in. If the scope of the day's duties expands beyond your control, use ICS to get more people or consider shuffling duties. On the bottom left-hand side of the board, there's a section to plan for additional staffing. Here's where you write who's available and at which times. Also, if someone is not available, you could also put that information in this area as well. On quiet days, you can use this section to write who's coming in on the next shift to get you in the habit of using it. Remember, it's better to have too many people than too few on busy days. The process of finding more people should have begun long before the incident. The people who are tasked with managing the weather event should not be worrying about who might be available in the heat of the moment. On the bottom right, we have a spot to write the contact information for any DSS events or incidents in the area. That way we don't have to search for their contact information if they need to be called quickly or if their information differs from what was given on the event support request form. On an average day, this is what our ICS tree might look like. The lead forecaster operates as the incident commander. He or she is running the shift. Since it's a benign day, the incident commander is also in charge of planning operations and logistics, as well as on the short-term forecast. In our example of day-to-day -day NWS operations, what falls under the umbrella of the planning section? Well, remember the planning section is responsible for maintaining information and intelligence on the current and forecasted situation, as well as the status of resources available to the office. The lead forecaster, acting as the planning section chief, helps with the morning briefing, though the execution of the briefing is often done by the public service unit, keeps track of the status of the radar and other equipment, fields phone calls from coworkers who may be late or sick, and makes sure that we are adequately staffed should someone be unable to make it in. On a benign day, the logistics section chief should be assigned to either the HMT or it could be held by the lead forecaster. As you recall, the logistics section is in charge of providing services and support needs related to the incident. In our case, we're in a permanent structure that provides for most of our needs. But every once in a while, we'll need some additional support from outside entities like the Snow Removal Service. But on benign days, this section would likely not be relevant. 
The operations section would hold the meat and potatoes of our daily operations. Here's the duties uh, that would be split up by those on hand and an additional staff member would rarely be necessary. Here's an example of our operations for a fully staffed day with three people instead of two. Note that most of the duties have not changed much, but the span of control was lessened further. So how does that look on the DSS board? The FIC is the incident commander and in addition to Forecaster 1. The FIC is also monitoring and posting in NWS chat. The general forecaster is handling several specialized duties like aviation and fire weather in addition to the DSS event. The HMT intern is taking care of traditional PIO duties, including social media, the weather story, checking the office service account email for reports from partners and the public, as well as executing the morning briefing to staff, handling up rare duties as well. Given the complexity of the day, a type 5, do these distributions seem appropri appropriate? Probably. Not all the magnets are assigned to someone. This is alright for a type 5 day. Just be sure that every position is considered before moving it to the margins. Alright, recall our DSS and staffing guide. It's hard to imagine a scenario where we would need 10 people on shift, right? We'll look at it this way. An additional person would be called in to run the shift and be the incident commander. The incident commander in this example is supposed to maintain overall situational awareness of the severe weather threat. The IC should have a big picture view of what's going on so that resources can be directed as needed, which includes perhaps calling in more personnel, usually fitting the job description of the plan section chief. The IC should be able to anticipate potential changes in the environment and workload, both in the immediate and more distant future. This requires occasional briefings from the ops section chief and radar operators. The IC is also in charge of clear intra-office communication and definition of individual duties, which includes filling out the DSS board and operations. Technically the job of a plan section chief who oversees incident documentation, as well as monitoring the staff for, for fatigue and taking steps to minimize that, like rotating folks out of radar ops and into something like data collection, should the need arise. The incident commander would also keep track of warnings and ensure that proper cancellation or an SVS is issued in a timely manner. This is normally the warning coordinator duty uh, and if the warnings become too numerous then perhaps the warning coordinator duty should be split off and now we're at eight people. In this example also the ESA serves as the logistics section chief which could be necessary if the radar has been acting up lately and we need to keep IT staff on through the event. The logistics section chief would also come into play if the staff is at the office long enough to need something like a pizza delivery or if a storm hits the office and a tree blocks the driveway. The logistics section chief would be in charge of finding someone to remove it. The public information officer recall is in charge of our message to the public. The PIO handles inquiries and interview requests, monitors chat and answers questions, relays important information to the chat rooms, and also stays on top of storm evolution and reports so that they can do so in a timely manner. The PIO is also in charge of our social media presence and should be soliciting reports on Facebook and Twitter as well as monitoring the information and pictures that come in. The PIO could also answer any overflow phone calls. The PIO would also notify downstream contacts of impending severe weather over the phone and would report any impacts and specialized DSS performed by the office to the Central Region Regional Operations Center, or the CR ROC. In this example, the forecaster in charge is operations section chief, as well as doing products, grids, fire weather, aviation, and this person's also the hydro forecaster. The lead forecaster would issue all the products and handle ESTF duties. As operations section chief, the lead would report directly to the IC about the latest forecast, including what's happening on radar, as reported to him or her by the radar coordinator and by the mesoanalyst, mesoanalyst tornado genesis specialist. The general forecaster would be handling DSS events, updating their forecasts if needed, and calling the point of contact with any criteria that meet the, def the identified thresholds for the incident and radar coordination. 
the second forecaster, also identified as the HMT intern, would be in charge of data collection, upper air duties, and would be helping the PIO with social media. You can also see in this example that radar duties are split by three people based on warning type. One would handle severe weather, one would, or severe thunderstorm warnings, one would handle tornado warnings, and the third would handle flash flood warnings. You could also break this up by sectors. Note that the flash flood analyst is different from the hydro person who would only be covering long fuse river products. A verification specialist assigned to the radar operators would help them by passing along verifying information that would be included in subsequent warnings, updates, and SVSs. So here's the planning board and what it may look like. Note that almost all of the magnets have been assigned to someone. The vast majority of cases will see events closer to the Type 5 case, but in any event, you must plan for staffing well ahead of time as a group. This will prevent last minute scrambling and maximize availability. So here's our happy little phone calling Brian. Hey Brian, yeah, it's work calling. We need help, can you be here in 10 minutes? Brian normally would be happy to help, but he accepted an invitation to the neighbor's barbecue and is not prepared to come into work. If he only had known yesterday that this was possible, followed by a phone call after the daily 9 a.m. tactics briefing to notify him that he would be needed, he would have been happy to work the event. He's a severe weather nut and is our best radar operator. Or, if he really needed to go to this barbecue, he could have put on the board that he was unavailable, and then he wouldn't have to bother the guy while he gets some much needed rest. We all know that staffing is an issue at times. What if we plan ahead and we still come up short? Well, it's easier to be creative when you have time. I've been in contact with our backup offices and we've talked about the possibility of backing up some of our operations as long as they're not directly impacted by the same severe weather event. They'd be more than happy to take our tasks or grids or regular products or keep an eye on social media and let us know in chat or collaboration chat when someone posts a relevant report. They just need to know ahead of time, that's the key, so they can staff up and not dump extra work on people last minute. Another reason to plan staffing well ahead of time as a group is face threat. Planning for staffing, like I said, well ahead of time and as a group will maximize availability and will be more effective. We all have different approaches and styles. We, re we respond to requests and make requests in different ways. Here we have the militant incident commander communicating in no uncertain terms that he is in charge and that she will do as he says. Mary is thinking about her Nana's birthday and is torn. We're not gov bots. We're people with lives outside of work who should be treated with respect. Conversely, the incident commander on the right is too timid. He knows what it's like to be bullied into working overtime against his will and doesn't want to make others feel the way that he felt. And he doesn't want to impose. I can do it all myself, he thinks. Neither situation is optimal. In both situations, we're dealing with face threat. In the situation on the left, Mary's intimidated by the IC and might be forced to make a decision that disappoints her family. She can't win. So she shows up to work the event, resents the IC, and is distracted the entire night and has a hard time refocusing on what she's been forced into. She would have gladly worked the next two days, but... Why today? Bart's just sitting at home watching TV. The managers all went home on time. Didn't anyone even ask them if they could help? The incident commander on the right decides that he would rather just do it all himself than deal with taking away people's time off. That's a form of face threat too. I can't do that to them, he thinks. I'd rather just work my tail off and deal with the fallout. Conversely, when decisions are made by the group for the group, we minimize face threat and refocus the decision making away from people and toward the task at hand. What's the best way to address the issue? So here's a rough outline of the group decision making process. First, you diagnose the problem. Let's say it's that we need more people between 3 and 10 p.m. to handle a severe weather outbreak. Second, you develop solutions and alternatives as a team. So in this case, you'd have to grab the schedule see who's already working. Can someone come in early or stay late? Do we have any X shifts who are willing to adjust their hours to cover the shortage? Is anyone off that might want to come in for some overtime? Are the managers able to stay late 
or come in for the event? Is the ASA available to help answer phones or monitor Twitter? Have we developed checklists and worksheets that may help the ASA collect the data that we need? The third step is evaluate. Test your solutions and alternatives. Write down your conclusions on the DSS board. In our example, Mary would be happy to help during Thursday and Friday's event, but she'll be going to her Nana's 90th birthday tonight. No big deal. We called Bart, and he's more than happy to cover tonight. He made plans to DVR his favorite shows. Also, the WCM can stay late until the evening shifter comes in and spins up and until the HMT launches the balloon. Then things should slow down. So we should be in good shape. Finally, you implement and monitor your decision. Once you decide who might be available and put them on notice, call them with confirmation of your decision ASAP. If it looks like things are not going to pan out, call them with that update too. Things slowing down? Could you release some people? These rubber meet the road decisions can be made by the incident commander, but the planning needs to be done by the group, preferably at the 9 a.m. tactics briefing. Another tip, actually use the DSS board. It will help you divide duties, keep span and control in check, and also stay on top of staffing options. We don't have to hold all the duties in our head and just hope we get them all done. Our shift duties change often enough to where we don't really have a default set of duties anymore. Also, if a duty is assigned to someone, they should know that it's their responsibility. When someone leaves for the day, who takes over their duties? Is it even a good idea for them to leave right now? Also, looking at the board might help us decide when someone may need to load shed or if we can distribute the duties more effectively based on who might be available. For example, Anita can make PowerPoint sing. She's a social media focal point. She sends out tweets faster than most of us can say the word tweet. Duties assigned to her are radar, products, hydro, grids, fire weather, and graphic casts. Krusty Clive, on the other hand, is assigned PIO, social media, and ESTF duties. What would you do? The leader should be adept at creating interactive teams that come together to address the entire fire picture and not just that within their limited span of control. Understanding how action affects another is critical, especially as the complexity of the fire increases. That's from the Wildland Fire Council leadership blog. Putting the right team together takes planning. Use the 9 a.m. briefing and the DSS board to set the incident commander and the team up for success. Once the incident is underway, the incident commander ensures that the resources that the group put in place for him or her are optimized. A common phrase in ICS is, leave your rank and ego at the door. Assigning personnel based solely on rank can hamper any organization's ability to respond effectively. There is room for leadership within a team, but there's not room for your ego. This is not about title. We are here to protect lives and property, and we owe it to the public to know ourselves and to know our team and to put the right people in the right places to make it easy for us to succeed. There's nothing in the rule book that says that the incident commander must be the MIC or even the lead forecaster. If a journeyman or the ITO or whomever has a handle on operations and a knack for organization while the lead is your best radar operator, the lead should do what he or she is best at, while someone else oversees the event. This has nothing to do with title and ever, has everything to do with how the team functions as a unit. So remember, check your ego at the door. If it doesn't light you up, you're not the right person for the job. The best teams consider who they have, what their strengths are, and then work to those strengths. Outstanding organizations perfect themselves. By using ICS daily, they actively seek out weaknesses where they exist and then adjust their practices to prevent failure in the future. By using the ICS system, they develop a commitment to resilience. Employing the strengths within the building or leaning on our backup offices in order to limit span of control is a critical component in the ICS system. Incident Command helps us plan as well as understand our partners when we need to fit into an outside incident management team. So use the DSS board to help plan. There are also printout copies of the board 
on a clipboard next to the DSS board and ops for planning future operational periods. It's easier to be creative and nimble if we put the pieces together in advance as a group. 20 heads are a lot better than one. And also work your strengths to contribute to a successful team. So thank you for listening. Please don't hesitate to offer feedback on this training to kelly.allen at noaa.gov. And again, I'd like to recognize Katie Branham, Chris Jones, and Reed Walcott for their contributions to the material in this presentation.